welcome, good morning um, to our friends in um, Israel, live from Jerusalem. I love saying that, our friends at Yad Vashem. I love your smile, Victoria, thank you. Um, good afternoon to you, to you all. And um, I just wanted to go over some logistics for today. In After our session, we will um, be sending all of you a PDH form for today, evaluation form. And I want to uh, remind all of you that um, saying this as a joke, you're getting your money's worth. You know that everything we do is free here at Stockton University. And so our evaluations are very important for us, for our partners at Yad Vashem, our partners at Echoes and Reflections, because we want to continue to offer you this free programming. Uh, the uh, presentation today is being recorded. Once it is um, edited, it will be up on our website and that takes several weeks, but it will be there for you. Uh, we will not be taking a break, but you're all at home or in a comfortable place. If you need to take a break, please do. Uh, but we will um, follow this, those of you that were with us yesterday, know that we'll be having a transition around 1035, something like that. I love saying this. We have two Davids uh, with us today, um, David Deutsch and David Sil Silberklang, both from Yad Vashem, who will be introduced by our um, bridge, our connector to Yad Vashem, director of uh, Echoes and Reflections, and um, part of the Yad Vashem International School of Education, Cheryl. Uh, okay. uh, Cheryl, I'm always mispronouncing your last name. Help me. Ochayon, Gail. Ochayon. Okay, Ochayon. Okay. 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 I should have left it as silver. That was my maiden name. A lot yeah, easier. That, right. Would have been a lot easier. You're right. But Ochayon. And um, we will be having time for questions. We're going to do with those of you that were with us yesterday, those that weren't. We're going to be doing like it was yesterday, where you put your questions in the chat. And um, at the last half an hour, we will be having time for questions. I'm challenging all of you because our Pleasantville High School students asked such excellent questions yesterday. So we look forward to your questions because that's one of the important parts of these presentations, clarification, how you can bring this information into your classrooms. And of course, our Pleasantville High School Students, we're challenging you. Keep it up. You were great yesterday. We look forward to your questions. And David Deutsch, our first presenter, requested that if you need a clarification as he's doing his um, presentation, to please put it in the chat because he would like to not go on if you needed a clarification, something he said, a testimony that you're listening to. And um, I wanted to just publicly via Zoom, thank Irvin Marino Rodriguez and Morgan Everman who make all of this happen. They are the glue. Thank you, Judy Vogel, Professor Vogel for clapping and we're all clapping with you. So thank you all so much. And I will turn this over to my friend, colleague, bridge connector, to uh, Yad Vashem and Echoes and Reflections. And I love saying this, so I just have to do it. Live from Jerusalem, here okay. are our three friends and colleagues from Yad Vashem. Cheryl. Thanks, Gail. And hi to everyone. First of all, a huge thank you to Gail because Gail is really what makes this happen. It's always wonderful to deal with Gail and to be at Stockton. And uh, we've done lots of programs in the past. And I really hope that we will continue to do them, of course. So my name is Cheryl Ochayon, as Gail said. I am the program director for Echoes and Reflections at Yad Vashem, the world 
Holocaust Remembrance Center. We are located in Jerusalem, Israel, which is where I am coming to you live from today. I have to say that because Gil likes it so much. Um, and uh, just to tell you a, a little bit about Echoes and Reflections for a couple of minutes, although there are those in the audience who know all about Echoes, it's good to see you, Vicki. Um, and I don't know if anyone else is here. Uh, Echoes and Reflections is a terrific program. It was the brainchild of three heavy hitters in the field of Holocaust studies, and those are the ADL, or what used to be called the Anti-Defamation League, USC Shaw Foundation, which was the repository of Steven Spielberg's Testimonies Project, and Yad Vashem, um, which is where I come from. The reason why the program is so amazing for those of you who teach history or teach English language arts or teach a lot of other subjects is because we have 11 fully developed units on our website. And those units include two, sometimes three, sometimes four comprehensive lesson plans that are full of resources like history PDFs. But in addition to that, we have art, we have poetry, we have literature. We have testimonies, of course. We have short video clips, films that you can use in the classroom. So everything is online. Everything is free of charge. The website is echoesandreflections.org. Um, very easy to find. And in this world of Zoom and COVID and all of the digital online, you know, that, that we've had to deal with in the past year, and my hat's off to all of you who are teachers who have had to do this in the past year, and also to you guys who are students uh, because you've had to put up with it for the past year. Um, in this whole digital world, Echoes and Reflections is a very convenient and very, very juicy resource for you to uh, sink your teeth into. So check out the website. Um, it's very also very user-friendly. 11 units, again, we work in kind of a logical order and you'll see what, what we have. And I, I do hope that you use it. So um, that's enough about me and what I do. Um, without any further ado, I would like to introduce to you all Dr. David Deutsch. Um, David is a colleague and I have the, the honor of working with him at Yad Vashem in the International School for Holocaust Studies. Um, he is currently the section head of Asia, Africa, and New Zealand, the section that deals with overseas education and training um, of teachers in those countries at the international school. He holds a PhD in sociology and anthropology from Ben Gurion University in Beersheba in Israel, and an MA in, Un in European studies from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. For the past 15 years, he's been teaching, lecturing, and guiding students and researchers from varied backgrounds and nationalities at the International School for Holocaust Studies. He's the author of several journal articles, and his most current work was published in Yad Vashem Studies and is entitled Religious and Halakha Observance in View of Deconstructing Processes of the Holocaust. Along with research and education, David has helped develop several distinctive curricula plans for high schools and universities in Israel and overseas. So without any further ado, Dr. David Deutsch, the floor is yours. Well, hi everyone. What a kind and elaborate introduction. Thank you so much. Um, 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 before I share my screen and before we dive into this topic, hello to all the students. Hello to all the Oh, thank you for hiring back to me. Uh, hi, all educators and teachers and whoever's with us. And actually, I'll, I'll begin with introducing the topic, why it's important, why it's relevant, and, and what we're going to do. B before I share my screen and dive into all the different aspects, one of the reasons why I will discuss with you today the issue of faith, faith in the Holocaust. And, and I must add to this that I'm talking about mainly around the areas I research faith in God or faith in humanity. That could also be a form of faith. And, and the reason is one, many of these victims, many of these survivors between 30 and 50%, depending where, were oriented towards faith, were religious, were observant, were devout. And, and the question that should, that arises and, and should puzzle us is, okay, what happens to that? What happens to an individual that his perception of faith 
is in direct contradiction with this reality of dehumanization. And that's a question hovering all this lecture. And that's a question which I will address. Be first, it's important because if we say, let's talk about an atrocity, right? Let's talk about the Holocaust, one of the atrocities. What are we talking about? Are we talking about how the pain was inflicted? Are we talking about those individuals that the pain was inflicted to them? What is our topic? And since our topic are the subjects, the recipients of the violence, those who suffered, those who underwent, so we have to discuss their background, their faith, their lack of faith, their questions of faith, how they perceived it. Now, I think whether I say this, I'll say it openly. I, I love the fact that there are students here. Do you know why? It enables me to speak more freely. And, and the thing is that, that, that when, when we discuss the issue of faith, of course, it's relevant to every single one of us because everyone has something he believes in and every one of us confronts an area or a time in life where that belief is fundamentally challenged. I think that doesn't, and, and this question, although in a m much more radical reality, in an impossible reality, is something that every single one of us could also relate to. So that is just a brief introduction of what we're dealing with. And that's the first question. Why am I discussing what I'm discussing, the issue of faith? It's because of the victims, because of the relevance. And the second question I wanna deal with is how do we discuss it? You know, how, um, the screen just, okay. Anyway, how do we discuss this issue of faith? What are the resources we use? Whom do we listen to? Let me give you an example. When you ask the question of what is faith, do you ask your pastors, rabbis, or do you ask the simple devout people? So where do you look for your answers? You know, in the elite or in the broader uh, uh, population? The second thing is, again, a matter of where do you look? Do you look for it in, in a paper and something someone has written or in words, something that someone has spoken? I, I want every one of you to think of the difference between a spoken word and a written document. When your teachers, dear students, and when you teachers, dear teachers, yeah, uh, introduce something to your students, you want them to learn about something, whether it be a, a, a historical event, an issue, do you present them with written documents that people use and wrote down and edited and thought about? And, you know, or do you present them with oral history, what people said, how they reacted? And every one of us knows the difference between Write, writing something or reading something or speaking. When you speak something, there are more paradoxes. It's more of a dialogue. You leave more gaps. There's something more immediate about it. So what I'm gonna do with you today is, first of all, I will tell you that the majority of research, history, lesson plans that taught students and teachers about what was faith during the Holocaust focused on one elite, formal, rabbis, you know, the, the more, the upper layers of society. And two, it focused on written texts. It focused on things people wrote rather than things people said. And what I will do with you in the time frame that I have today is I will redirect our focus to oral testimonies. And the USC, the Shaw Foundation Archive, which is the archive I base most of the testimonies we'll be seeing today, is uh, uh, that was uh, uh, um, part of Steven Spielberg's, Spielberg's project is what we will base ourselves today upon. And the idea is to see what do we gain? What do we benefit from listening to the simple testimonies of these people? Now, I will say one last comment. So we discussed of why, we talked about how, and now I'll talk about what, and that is, what will be the content of what we will see? There are several ways to see what is the purpose of faith in those conditions. Like why would someone hold on to his faith despite the conditions that are fundamentally against what he's or she is experiencing? And the question of why gives the content of what drove these individuals to believe in what they believed. And we will see in the oral testimonies diverse answers. We will begin with a very traditional answer. That'll be the first testimony I will show you very soon. We will analyze that answer. I'm gonna, now I'm giving you the outline of my lecture. 
Okay, so the first will be one testimony that will present you with what I would call a traditional way of thinking about these uh, uh, people that held on to their faith. And after that, we will ask questions through testimonies and challenge that perception. Okay, so I hope that was clear up until now. And now I will do the magic of screen sharing with optimized sounds. And all right, this is faith and religious observance and view of deconstruction processes in the Holocaust. I've addressed what resources do we use. Now you see here that I say, what does uh, a faith, sorry, not the faith, what does faith and religious observance mean? I, I, I added religious observance because think of it this way, religious observance, in Jewish tradition, faith is part of religious world. And it's not only about faith, it's not only about believing, a lot of it is about practice. So many of these people had forms of practice under those conditions. And what we will try doing today is see through the testimonies, through the resources, how they perceived God, tradition, religion, through both what they said about their faith, but also through their practices. The um, trajectory of my lecture today will begin with a bit historiography, really briefly, less than a minute, but I'll talk about what was written up until today in this field. The second will be what I would call the continuity paradigm, which means how usually people perceive the idea of faith under the conditions of the Holocaust. And actually, if I say this openly, what usually people perceive as the purpose of faith generally in a hard situation. And after that, I will challenge that paradigm through other testimonies. So without further ado, I wanna show you a testimony. And let me give you a bit of background about each one of these testimonies and generally about these testimonies. All of the testimonies are you, I use for this lecture were taken out of or ghettos or concentration camps. Most of them are out of, taken out of the concentration camps, meaning people that talk about their experience, talk about how they practiced religious uh, uh, rituals in conditions where they had nothing to eat, in conditions where they, many times, most of their family at this point were dead, in conditions where they did not know if they would wake up the next morning. Let me give you just one brief example to exemplify what I mean. One of these survivors said that usually when he used to pray before the Holocaust, he used to pray for long-term goals, meaning he used to pray for him to uh, be better, to finish the year well, to, and he said that in the Holocaust, the time frame of his prayers shifted, changed. He says, no longer would I pray for, you know, the days to come, the week to come, the year to come. He says, I couldn't even pray. I used to, I couldn't even pray for the next day. I used to pray, he says, for hours. He says, at night, I used to pray that the morning will come. And in the morning, I used to pray just that I see the night. And this just gives you in, in a nutshell, an example of how fundamentally different their perceptions of faith, prayer, religious practice were. That being said, let me give you an example of what I would call the a very common form of testimony. I call it the continuity paradigm. Of course, there are many people that speak in this way and that introduce this perception of the role of faith. And this is Rabbi Salomon Kalibach. The context is in Auschwitz, and I'll let you listen to him for yourself. And if there's any problem, as you know, wait, let me open this larger. Cheryl, if there's any problem, just uh, let me know, and I'm available on my WhatsApp. So if I hope you hear this well. Uh, there's just a phenomenal thing happened there that, uh, as I said to you before, every time you came to the barracks, I was, I was all day out, all day out on the work detail, and I came in the evening into the barracks. So there was just other pandemonium. People were screaming and 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 uh, and, and, and crying and uh, and shouting at one another and uh, pleading and begging. Some uh, to the point of already having become insane and pleading with God to end their suffering and whatever. It was, it was just. Uh, a pandemonium based on, on, on a population of uh, thousands of people like in a state of utter despair. And uh, um, 
this picture of my father standing on a table and, and, and lighting the Hanukkah candles and having a group of children around him singing the uh, Hanukkah songs. And then he's speaking with a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a powerful voice about that this is uh, uh, nevertheless a station for a Jew who has faith in God. There's a world to come. There's a time of, uh, of the Messiah. Then redemption will come to the people. And even if uh, right now the situation seems to be hopeless, that, uh, they shouldn't uh, lose their faith and their trust that uh, everything is uh, ordained uh, so by uh, God Almighty. And uh, it is for them to uh, believe that uh, uh, perhaps that they have to go through these uh, sufferings in uh, this world and uh, uh, find then uh, solace and salvation in the world to come. And that type of uh, talk, which uh, uh, apparently uh, uh, struck a note this uh, this despairing uh, multitude and uh, there was suddenly like a silence in the huge barracks and uh, these uh, sick and despairing people they were just like sort of poking their heads out of their cubicles and see uh, what was that spectacle that was going on there and uh, uh, certainly is a, a picture that I did not see from close up but I was uh, uh, Way back in the barracks, I just come back from uh, uh, the work detail, and I saw it like uh, as a panorama, and it struck me how many people, uh, many of them were uh, never Orthodox, they perhaps never uh, attended a ceremony of lighting a Hanukkah candle and so on. So this whole picture made such an impression on them that they must have gotten at least some uh, sort of... Uh, of uh, uh, encouragement from it, otherwise they wouldn't have kept silent and stopped doing whatever they were doing uh, in order to, uh, to be part of that. So he describes a situation, Rabbi Salomon Kalebach describes a situation of utter despair, a pandemonium, a, a reality where they're losing hope. And then his father with a group of kids sing these religious songs. And that creates sort of a bubble, an external reality something that negates camp life, something that hope in a way is linked with faith. And that gives them sort of an island which is detached from the camp life in order for them to see something so different than the reality that they're faced. The purpose of it is to create in a way a continuity of their normality that was before and their hopeful realities after. Now, if you look at it in, in words, he uses the, the, the word relevant to describe it is a word that's close to the word crisis, meaning there's uh, a good point of origin, a horrific rich situation now, and an idea of redemption to come. And I would keep this in mind that there's a huge difference between the word crisis and the word trauma, which is a different word, has a different perception, doesn't have the scope or the trajectory of hope. And what is very interesting in this testimony and very common in many, but not in all testimonies, and this is what's so important for me to tell you. What's common here is that faith is linked to hope. And I wanna show you the research that was written about it. The research that was written about when, when scholars asked themselves, okay, let's understand why these people held on to their religions, although they didn't have to, handle, held on to their traditions, although it negated camp life, held on to their beliefs, although it seemed impossible. Why did they do that? And the main paradigm or the main thought that scholars focused on, and this is just what one example that I'm putting in front of you so you can read, is that if the reality they were faced with was they became less and less of a subject, less and less of a human. The individual drowned deeper into the abyss as Professor Yafeliach writes. The ritual and faith, prayer, what did it do? The Jews designated and sanctified these few moments, separating them from the twisted reality that surrounded them. It helped them, I'm reading, this act helped them to hold on to their life before, 
making some sort of continuity. It provided the idea of hope. And as they compared themselves to, to uh, uh, the slaves imprisoned by Nazi camps were the same as the uh, 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 Hebrews in Egypt and they were waiting for the Messiah for this war to end. Let me continue on. She says that, that the act of faith was a demonstration against Nazi conditions and does not, that Judaism does not submit to the conditions, that they tried maintaining their traditions and that they tried to create, I'm reading from the end of her text, a separate sphere of holiness to the horrific reality of the concentration camp, a link between past and future, Jewish continuity, and they also compare themselves to the ancient Hebrews that overcame Pharaoh. And this, even for a moment, even for a brief second, created a separate sphere of hope, of separateness, which enabled them to hold on to some form of their subjectivity. This theory makes sense. Yes, one second. Let me make sure that you can, I, oh, okay, yes, full screen indeed. Okay, this theory make, absolutely makes sense. And it is, it is common, I would say, do not quote me on this, but I would say in 20 to 25% of the oral testimonies, the idea you're seeing here is relevant. But in 75% of the testimonies, devout Jews, people of faith speak differently. And I'll tell you even more than that, the same Rabbi Salomon Karlibach and another part of his testimony speaks very differently than what he speaks here. So before we challenge this, let me give a bit of a summary of the ideas we noticed. The ideas we noticed that are relevant to what I'm mentioning here are, sorry, look at this one over here. The three main ideas that we saw in this testimonies was continuity, a religious observance and faith served as a positive element for the camp prisoners, meaning if they believed in faith, it helped them hold on. The religious observance and faith were negated to the camp conditions. Those are the main three elements we saw if I sum it up in a very brief and overly simplified way. That being said, let's listen to another testimony that demonstrates a very different perception of what this was for camp prisoners. And Cheryl, if there's any problem of listening, just let me know. This is Erno Abelitz. And I want you to think together of the same ideas we said. Faith was positive in the context of camp. It created continuity and it was separate, created a separate sphere of camp life. And now let's see if this follows through in Erno Abelitz's testimony, again, from Auschwitz. My brother, had a, a, a mazor, um, Jewish bread, Sorry. evening pizza bread. Occasionally, he had, he had a bit of bit this of piece of salami or, or something. My brother didn't eat it, but I I I, I ate it. I I thought I have to. Well, it's uh, most important. I realize that we are we are now in exceptional exceptional times, and and the main aim in life now is to survive. And anything else will be subordinate to that. And to be surviving, not only, not only, not only forget about Jewish practice, but also forget about that you are a human being. Anything, anything which which matters in life. If you if you start thinking what you are, what happened, then you will just go and electrocute yourself to the to the electric wire. But I thought I mustn't think about it. I just has to behave like an animal. Just, just survival, survival. To avoid being being uh, beaten up, avoid try to get as much food like uh, as as you can, and just survival. And everything spiritual comes if you manage to survive. Mm -hmm. And I had had some great doubts about it. At the end of the day, I I will survive even even after when I survived the selections. There's an important sentence here, and he says that if you think of anything spiritual you will go and electrocute yourself. I want that sentence to resonate with you. I want you to think of the, sometimes people, many times people mean what they say, especially survivors. What does he mean by making that, by creating that link? Take a pause, a mental pause. If I think of anything spiritual, that's his words, I will go and electrocute myself. Why is that the link he creates? And is that the positive link between spirituality 
and hope and survival. He says, actually, there's a negation. If you think of spirituality, you lesser your chances of survival. You, why is that? In order for us to understand, I want you to see another testimony of Erno Abelitz. And in the following testimony, on the one part, he's very proud of his Jewish heritage. He's very proud to be a religious Jew. And on the other hand, he says about the pause of it when he was in the camps. So let's listen to the following testimony and then say a few words about that. Most of this lecture, by the way, and I see this as a great mission of mine, is to be in a way as minimal as I can and to let you listen to these testimonies with uh, uh, um, a bit of interpretation as much as we have time for. When you look back over all that you've been through in your experience, what is there a message that you feel that you want to, to hand on to your children and grandchildren? Well, very, very difficult. Not, I'm not being a not being a, an ideologist, just an ordinary person. All, all what I can tell them, we are very, very staunch to our religion. And uh, with all the difficulties, we manage, I, 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 I feel as everybody who survived is a victory over Nazism, over Hitler, and it's a victory for the Jewish nation and for the Jewish faith. And if we, if we, if we don't keep to our faith, then end of the day is the victory is again Hitler, mm -hmm. and not us. And this is very important. And I try to bring them up the children. They should be loyal to to. To, to the Jewish uh, beliefs and practice. And uh, thank God I'm very successful. Mm. Children are all wonderful children. Did, did, was your faith at any time? Uh, quite honestly, while I was in Auschwitz, the only way you could survive that you don't think of faith and God and anything. Don't think of anything spiritual. Mm -hmm. Just think of yourself as an animal and whose duty is not to be taken to the slaughterhouse and to get as much food as you can. And you don't think about this thing. If you start thinking about it, then you, then, then you are lost. If you look around, what, happen, what happens here to us, uh, then the conclusion would be not favorable for survival. Mm -hmm. So I, was, I made a conscious effort at that time, which I think it was a right decision, not to think of anything spiritual. Though the occasion when I felt desperate, I prayed to God to help me. There's, I'd say, three paradoxes here, but we're, we're going to just address a bit of what he says. First, he begins with being proud of his heritage. Then he says in Auschwitz, and I want you also to be sensitive to the difference between reading something and listening to something, how different it is in the way you perceive it. And, and in his testimony, what he addresses is he begins with the fact that you couldn't think of anything spiritual. And he says, there's too much of a gap. And that's, I'm going back to the testimony before, the reality of the camp and the idea of spirituality, which reminds him of his normality is in too much of a gap for him to sustain. And, but he, at the end of the testimony says, though occasionally I prayed to God to help me, which means faith, he doesn't say there was. It served as a negative tool. Practice, almost nothing, but prayer was there. And I see that in many other testimonies that there's a difference between prayer and faith. And although people that say my faith wasn't as strong as it was or didn't even exist, they do find ways to pray. And I think one of the reasons in, is, and I saw this in other testimonies as well, is there's a difference between prayer and faith. Where faith, you have to sustain to some degree, some kind of belief in something. And prayer is a freer version of relationship with the divine. Meaning many of them in prayer, and maybe I'll show you some of them, do not pray for salvation. Do not pray for um, redemption, but actually pray for something else. And in order for me to exemplify the difference between prayer and between uh, 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 faith, I want to show you one of the following testimonies. Now, before we continue, uh, when I present this, you know, these testimonies to secular people or to very secular people, they all tell me, yeah, you see, they didn't really believe there's no God. They didn't, 
And when I present it to religious people, you see they, they answer, despite their disbelief, they still believe. And, and the truth is that I think that in these testimonies, they have a gray zone. They have a flexible understanding of belief. They have a complex version of what God meant to them. They could hold on to prayer, but not faith. They could hold on to it in a certain way, but not a different way. They could hold on to it for a while, but not for too long. So what is important for me to show you in these testimonies is the different versions of relationship between faith and those people that try to carry it under those conditions. But in order for me to show you, as I said, the other testimony to show you how prayers carried a different version of, this is a very, very hard testimony to watch. And, but it is, mind opening to me, at least. And that's one of the reasons I wanna share it with you. And the testimony of Manya K, she talks about the reality where they had to dress. And after they had to, they were uh, uh, abused by the Nazis. And at some point, of course, she doesn't really believe she says at that point, but she does pray. And I want you to think before she says what she prays for, what would you assume she would pray for? and then listen to what actually she prays for in those conditions. And these are connected to a few issues that are very relevant, not only dehumanization, but also the issue of sexual violence that is hardly spoken, but was very relevant to uh, uh, at least to many of these survivors. And usually they felt very uncomfortable speaking about it, but here she does speak about it a bit. And I will share this testimony with you in order to show you how even when faith fades away, there's some kind of prayer. And even when the traditional prayer doesn't really work, she finds other ways to pray. We had to undress naked. It was snow, ice, cold. There was... Um, like a... I don't know how to describe you. A big um, round um, dish, whatever it was, it was huge, like a small pool. We had to dip in that solution to disinfect, to get rid of the eyes, of the lice. It was bitter cold. The SS was standing around the women and the men with the dogs. They took pictures and they made fun. I felt so degraded. I felt so humiliated. I was praying that the end of the world should come. I was praying that um, if there is God, because at that point of my life I had doubts. So I was praying if there is a God, He should show something, a sign, a miracle, but I wasn't praying for to be liberated. I was praying that a hole in the ground should open and everybody should sink in. That was such a degradation. That was such a hum undescribable humiliation. You stand naked, you cold, you hungry, and they're standing, they're petting their dogs, they're smoking cigarettes, and they're laughing. There isn't any worse thing what can happen to a human being. Absolutely nothing. This is, I, 
I myself have to take a moment after these uh, testimonies. But, you know, when I present them, sometimes educators say, but why'd you present such a hard testimony? So I ask myself, wait, whose responsibility is to listen and whose responsibility is it is to tell? And, and I see it as both educators and students, it's our responsibility to expand the ways we listen rather than limit what we want to hear. And she explains exactly what was her faith, what was her prayer, in the time she says, there's nothing worse that can be done to a human being. This is the, but she still prays. She can't have faith. She says, if there's a God, and I had my doubts. So faith is questionable, but prayer was there. But she's not off asking for prayer of redemption. The reality in front of her eyes is so extreme, so degrading that, you know, praying for redemption or for something to be better seems so out of context. So she prayed for the relevant redemption, for the closer one. And the closer one is let everything sink into a hole and be swallowed. That would be the right solution for such a reality. And when he said, at times I pray to God to help, I try to unpack those words and say, okay, let's see together what that prayer means and what that prayer serves. Now, many people usually expect of a lecture like my own, of faith in the Holocaust, to go out of that lecture and say, oh, wow, faith, that's what helped us going. That's what made us hold on. But usually people that do that listen to themselves rather than the testimonies. Faith served different things for different people in different contexts. They reconfigured the idea of faith. They reconfigured the idea of prayer so it fits what they could do. Let me give you an example of that, and, and um, you, you, you can see the subtitles here. And she talks a bit about, uh, Nili Kochva talks about the fact that she finds a prayer book, but it's not the right prayer book. It's the wrong prayer book. But if it's the wrong prayer book, what's the purpose of it? And then she, she explains actually what's the purpose of prayer and faith in this context. And she explains it as a purpose that has nothing to do with God, but rather with the individual, the subject himself. And this is connected to what I'm trying to say is that these camp prisoners, these survivors took the idea of faith, prayer, practice. They could no longer use it the way it was because the realities were broken, were devastating, were degrading, as she said, and had to reconfigure it to the realities they, 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 they constructed. You know, one, one survivor said that the God was in the camp only to the degree that the survivors let him in. So let's listen to this version of Nili Kochva and full screen. It's in Hebrew, but you'll see the subtitles, hopefully. Yes. והם אמרו אחריי. עכשיו, זה בוודאי שלא כך מתפללים, אבל מה זה היה משנה? לי זה לא אמר כלום. העיקר שיחשבו שזה עוזר להם. אז שיתפללו כך. מה זה משנה? מה זה היה משנה לי שהתפללתי איתם בערב מה טוב הוא, או אני יודעת מאיזה תפילה, מתי? העיקר שיאמינו שזה עוזר. רק אני, לבריאות. ביום כיפור זה באמת, השתדלנו מה שרק אפשרי, דומה לזה, להתפלל. זה באמת עזר הרבה. כי הבכי עוזר. וביום כיפור הצליחו לבכות הרבה. כל מי שהצליח לבכות, אגר כוח. זה היה לי חשוב מאוד. זה היה הטקסט, ואני אקרא רק את הסוף, כי הקריאה באמת עזרה. מי שהיה יכול לקרוא גאה 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 ג
it didn't, the purpose of faith or belief in this aspect had nothing to do with God, it had to do with the fact that uh, structural belief, you know, believe in something, just have that form. And, you know, and she says something very interesting. She says that when you cried, it helps. And I want to compare what she says with your permission to, to what Erno Abalet says. Erno Abalet says, if you think about your reality, you will go and electrocute yourself. And she says the exact opposite. If you do not think, if you're unable to process, the purpose of belief, the purpose of prayer, the purpose of cry is to have a bridge to processing, is to, you know, whoever cried stood a greater chance of survival, she said. It was like a vitamin to believe in something, to cry about something, to pray about something. And she has an absolute 180 degrees different perception than Erno Abalitz. For him, avoidance of spirituality was a tool. And for her, actually, the ability to express, to cry, to reach out to that aspect of yourself. So what I'm trying to show you is, on the one hand, how different these testimonies are and how they don't only serve as a positive tool. And furthermore, how they're connected to camp life. And, you know, in this testimony, I will not show you it since, again, it's in Hebrew, but it's written down. Rina Fratkin says about one of the rituals they arranged. She says, you know, when we did the ritual that was related to our, uh, you know, it was a, it's a similar ritual to what Jews used to, uh, it's a, a remembrance to their times when they were slaves under the Egyptians. It's a biblical story that the Hebrews were slay, enslaved by the Egyptians. And, and the interesting thing about this testimony is that she does compares the Jews in the camps, not to the Hebrews in the Bible, but to the Egyptians in the Bible. The way the plagues were, yes, we had everything. We had it all there, the plague of darkness. There was no electricity, no water, frogs. We had lice. There was skin disease, uh, uh, et cetera, hunger, the plague, uh, the plague of the firstborn. It was all there we had the same plagues. Her comparison is not one that negates this story uh, from camp life and connects it to Jewish tradition. It's one that takes the original story and turns it around. She says, wait, in this story, we're the Egyptians. In this story, we're the recipients of God's fury. We're the recipients of his punishment. We're, we're not like the Hebrews. Now this she does out of, you know, this, oral testimony that she just speaks it out. She doesn't plan on saying it this way. She says it in a way that for her, the religious act and faith are not something that are different to her reality in the camp. It's an expression of that reality that she's in. Um, since I have a bit more time, I would like to show you one more testimony that has to do with faith. And then we'll talk about the style of faith. and. The, the following testimony is, you know, there's another question that, that maybe I'll pose. When, when I say the word faith with you, I usually use one word, but I shouldn't be using one word. I should be using many words um, because, or I shouldn't see it as a singular idea. Imagine one, actually once I've, I've uh, uh, um, in a lecture I've heard of a religious thinker, they asked him, what does he believe in? He said, my belief is like this, uh, uh, he, he generally said it shifts, it changes. It never stays the same. It's not the same size fits all. And given that idea, I wanna show you the testimony of Helen Handler. And I want you to notice as we go along two things, notice each time what she believes in, notice the context she believes that in, and notice the, the reasoning. Why does she say she believes what she believes in? This is a, about three minute testimony. And in those three minutes you'll see, and that's why I'm saying using one word faith for different formations of it is usually reducing it to singularity where actually we're talking about an idea of a diversity of faith, even within the same um, person. So this is Helen Handler and her three minute testimony of what was faith for her. After the war, I really believed in God in war. That's a question I always get. Of course I believed. What else was I going to believe? I certainly be couldn't believe. Notice, I'm going to go step by step. She says, what else was I going to believe in? 
So what does that mean as far as reasoning? Of course I believed in God. What else was I going to believe in? There's some, in another testimony, there's a woman that says that when she's asked about her belief, why did she believe? She says, listen, I was so alone. I was so detached that I needed something. And the reason she openly and reflectively understands that it has nothing to do with whether the divine entity exists or not. She's explaining her faith from an absolutely psychological standpoint. She says, the reason I believe this, I did not want to be alone. So in a way, this relates to that. It relates to the idea, what was I going to believe in? She does have the need to believe, but the rest of her beliefs, the rest of her belief systems collapse. Let's see what else she says. Believe in human compassion or justice or law. I couldn't even believe in a just God. I didn't know what I was doing there. Notice this. I, the monotheistic religions usually believe in a benevolent God, uh, almighty God, and an all-knowing God. Those are the three things, whether it's Islam, Christianity, or Judaism. In, in these three traditions, and usually all three religions like to put the benevolence of God in, at the top. And if they have questions, they say, oh, we don't have an answer for that. But she says, no, 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 no. I could not believe in a just God. I did not know what I was doing there. She deflates one of the three most important pillars of what God would mean in a monotheistic and Jewish tradition. I had to believe in a God of miracles. And yes, a I... God of miracles is also a God that, you know, in every step of the way saved her, a subjective God. But look at her next insistence that she says, yes, I believed in God. I believed in God. Only the people who believed in God survived. And you couldn't let go for a second, because if you let go, you couldn't work your way up. So yes, I believed. But once I was saved, I, I couldn't believe. This is an incredible testimony. Because she says, okay, during the war I believed. As soon as I was saved, no, no, then, then it's irrelevant. Then I couldn't believe. Then, then she faces what actually she has in front of her. It's a, she's a, the absolute opposite from Elno Abelis. Elno Abelis believes before, believes after, during he puts it aside. She says, during I believed, I believed in a God of miracles. I believed in, 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 uh, in that context because it helped me survive. As soon as it was over, I couldn't believe. Hi, David. When this is just your friendly reminder for the 10 minute warning. Cool. We will be done in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I said, how can I ask God forgive him? Forgive me. I didn't forgive him yet. And then I had a child. Yom Kippur is a day where you go to the synagogue and repent. And God forgives you for all of your sins that you've done. It's a, a, Christianity has this version of Islam. Every monotheistic version has this uh, 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 um, washing away sins kind of thing. And she says, I did not go to synagogue for God to wash away my sins. I, I did, I, why should he? I didn't forgive him. She Is that belief or non-belief? She was in a point where in a way, she says she didn't believe, but she has some kind of anger. And she has not more than that. She reverses the perception of what the day of repentance means. She's expecting, or not expecting, but in the perception of it's God's uh, objective to reach her forgiveness, which she hasn't given yet. And then she talks, that's stage number two. And then she talks about her child. And I knew that I owe another Jew to the Jewish people. But how am I going to do it? Not through me. Because she is not religious. So she cannot educate him, but she wants him as part of Jewish religion. Notice how tenacious this woman is, how polar her perception of belief is, how complex it is, and how wonderful it is by being so complex. She says, I want it, but I can't do it. I can't advocate for it after all I've been through. So I put him in a day school and I expected them to raise a Jew, what is of course a mistake. So today 
Mom, you were so many dimensional, he says, and now you are just one dimensional. Means she came back to religion and her son says, wait, you were more secular. You had so many dimensions. Why did you become so singular in your religious thinking? Well, it took me many years, but I came to a full circle. I, I still work at it very hard. But when people ask me, do you believe in God? Well, we are talking. <laughs> Look at her answer. Do you believe in God? She doesn't say yes. Well, we are talking, I say. She keeps it ambivalent. She keeps it in a way that she implicitly implies or understands that the um, question is greater than the answer. And the last testimony I want to show you before I sum these things up is to end with the same person we began with. And we began with Salomon Kalibach. And Salomon Kalibach, also he, has in a different part of his testimony, a different perception of what the religious act actually means. And we talked about faith, we talked about the different roles of it, we talked about diversity, and our last testimony will show you sometimes polarity within a testimony. And remember, we began with the continuity paradigm. So let's see how he provides the profile of the religious act. When you imagine a religious act in a camp, a dreadful camp, the conditions are impossible, and yet people pray, people have some kind of faith, people have some kind of religious practice, how does it look like? You mentioned that in the Riga ghetto there was some semblance of Jewish life. Yes. Did this, um, was there, did this continue into this uh, workstation that you were at afterward? Barely, barely. There were uh, just a couple of other uh, from fellows, you know, Orthodox people with me over there and certainly not enough to uh, organize it. Uh, but we did uh, time to time get together and remind each other that today is this uh, holiday and that and uh, perhaps a special prayer. I don't think anybody had a prayer book there available. And so, so it was it was very, very meager, very little, but it was enough to remind you that you are, that you are, that you are, uh, that you are, uh, uh, a Jew that is called, who is committed to his religion, except like the circumstances were such, like I told you before, that you were, were just numb and, and, and you lived from day to day, from assignment to assignment, from uh, from bowl of uh, of food to the next bowl of food, like, uh, and uh, there were no thoughts of any uh, heroic or dramatic uh, initiatives, like uh, uh, waking up in the middle of the night and nobody was watching and uh, getting together and so saying a tearful prayer, none of that uh, took place over there. And, uh, um, uh, it was, it was uh, miraculous. Uh. So, he says there were no thoughts of heroic or dramatic things. However, at the beginning of his testimony, he talks about his father. It's in the same place. And that was heroic and dramatic, or not, I don't know, but what he's trying to do, and that's what I assume he's trying to answer the assumption of the interviewer. When you ask someone something, you usually are directing him to answer in a certain way. And what he's trying to say, in other words, he's saying, you know, if you were thinking of the act, the religious act, or faith as a glorified thing, waking up in the middle of the night, having a tearful prayer, no, it was small, it was meager, it existed. And if you were thinking of a heroic act, no, it was, it was what we can do under those conditions. And in order for me to sum it up, I want to show you a few of the charts that, that come out as an analytic uh, um, kind of uh, conclusion of what we've discussed today. There is no one religious role of spirituality. Each one of these survivors understands it differently whether some spirituality or faith serves a negative role, and for some it so serves a survival, and for others it, it's hope or instrumental. For every one of these uh, survivors, the profile, how the religious act look, how, how does faith look like is different. Everyone adapts differently, as you can see, and the perception of God also is restructured to different measures. 
What I can say that is noticeable and that is common in these oral testimonies that we can see, that we've listened to today, is, you know, the first is the diversity of them, but the second, which I find incredibly inspiring, is the fact that they are, they're aware, they know how they are using faith and they use it in the way they choose to use it. They don't take it for granted. They restructure, restructure to the measures they needed in that reality. Many of them deglorify the act. Many of them don't see it as something that's connected to Judaism or even to God, but something that's connected to themselves, to their subjectivity. Many of them restructure it to their conditions. They hardly use the words hope or something like that. They more use the word survival. They don't, they symbolize the event. And I find it fascinating, and maybe this is a good time to open the floor for questions, that under those conditions where they're very much aware of, of uh, the collapse of their subjectivities, of their conditions, of the fact that they already in a way lost hope, they still in a way insist, of ha insist on having some kind of spiritual element to some degree that fits them in those, under those conditions. So that is very briefly what I've tried to do. And, and I think one of the benefits, and I'll do a bit stop sharing so I could see your faces. And, and I think one of the benefits and is something like this is a few things. A, I, I, this is, I did this less academic than I'm used to doing this workshop, I must admit. I did it more to, to demonstrate what happens when we shift our focus from the elite written texts to oral testimonies. And, and what happens to us as viewers when we come with expectation of what faith means? I want every one of you to ask yourself a simple question. What did we expect to hear about faith? And where do we expect to locate faith in our perception of survival mechanisms and of betterness of an individual? And what does this tell us about the flexibility of faith, about the potency of it? And this is just in a nutshell, what I've presented to you, part of a larger research, uh, a book I submitted not long ago about really focusing on the simple believers and how they had to alter, shift, restructure, and yet stay part. And I'll end with a story I presented it to this, uh, to, um, to really, really religious Jews from Chabad. I don't know if you know that. And, and, and I was really afraid that they'll all say, hey, but that's not believing in the God that, that, that we expected and this is that. And, and they, they were all, first of all, in, in awe about the testimonies. One of them comes to me and he says, thank you. I asked, what for, I just give you a letter. He says, suddenly it makes sense to me. He says, suddenly, you know, you know, it didn't make sense to me that they held onto their faith no matter what, because that's, there's something inhuman about that. And, and suddenly it made sense to me how they did hold on to faith under those conditions. So with that note, I will open the floor to questions and, um, and you can ask in any direction about the research or about other testimonies or similar testimonies, anything you'd like. So thank you for now and I'm open thank for- Thank you so much, Dr. Deutsch. And uh, Morgan will be calling on our educators and maybe some of our students, Darren, let us know if any of uh, the students have questions. Morgan, it is you, you are on. Great, so the first, we have a few questions lined up in the chat. So uh, the first question comes from Leanne. Leanne, I'm gonna unmute you and you can ask your fantastic questions as I know a lot of educators probably use night in the classroom. Hello, hello. <laughs> All right, so let me see here. My question, I wrote it down just to, in terms of the pictures here. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, Dr. Deutsch, thank you for your presentation. Um, I teach night, as I'm sure many people do, and certainly in night, Wiesel describes his own struggles with the Holocaust, and even I usually reference some of my students to some of his other characters, Akiba Drumer, Yuliak, um, as some other individuals who talk about their own struggles with faith. Um, and I felt that some of Wiesel's comments, like the speaker Abelez, um, does talk of praying at times 
even when he is at a low point in his own believing in God. Um, so I was wondering if there were any ways you could help us make connections to use some of the resources you showed today within the context of night to help deepen students' understandings, um, you know, or if you had any other comments on that work specifically um, and discussions of faith there. Sorry about my 16 month old here. <laughs> no, I'll never be sorry. That is so, I was just, I, I couldn't concentrate on the question. But, <laughs> but, but I, as far as night, I think I'll say something like this and, 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 and Elie Wiesel also. Elie Wiesel is elite. It's a wonderful book. It's a wonder, but it's edited. He wrote it and then he said, oh, this is good. This is, oh, let's read, let's think about. Also Primo Levi, anything written carries its benefits, but also carries its disadvantages. There's something very, and, and also I'll say another thing, he's a man. I'm sorry for saying this, but there, what you've noticed here in my presentation have equal representation of women and men, which does not exist in most formal texts. There's there's what I would do. I would counterbalance Elie Wiesel's testimony with a fe female testimony of what prayer means to her. Let's say the testimony of Manya K or, or the testimony of, uh, of, of uh, um, Helen Handler, both female testimonies are, they both speak of prayer, but so, uh, of belief and prayer, but so differently. She, she, she doesn't pray for something optimistic. I think to, in a way I would, I would present what it is to have a written text and that presents it in a certain way. And I will also present the benefits of showing it from a different way and how we can could, could learn from seeing it from alternate perspectives and not from a unified. This is how cliches are created and, 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 and limiting paradigmatic thinkings where, where in reality, cliches don't exist. They just exist in our perceptions about realities. Um, so I think what I would do is I would absolutely present night, but I would also present our students with the wonderful resources of Shaw Foundation, which are the, the digital archives, and with the, the advantages. I, I showed it to you now when you, at the same time, read the testimony of Erno Abaletz and also saw it, you noticed how different it reacts with how you perceive the individual. And I think that is very important. And also the female, I would balance it. That's what I would do. I would provide a testimony and teach our, our, our learners how to see it from alternate perspectives and open them to other perspectives, by the way. It doesn't end by that. Art that can express something that words can't as well. And that's why my presentation began with a, a, a Tolkachev, that, that, that in his art, he, he paints on both sides because he can't stop painting. And that's his way of expression. And, and to, to some degree, you know, what, what both words, whether they're written or spoken, have to be narrativized. Art does not. Art doesn't have to carry a narrative. Art sometimes can express the things that words cannot. I, I wanna say something about, uh, I'll continue that. It, it's, it's also to expand, use Elie Wiesel as a starting point, expand to oral, expand to art, and expand to another thing that we don't talk because we're Westerners and we don't like it so much, but we don't talk about music. And why don't we talk? Because in our heritage, in our memory processes, especially the Jewish ones, we remember through spoken word, a bit through music, not so much. But if you talk to Roma descendants of World War, of, of, of the Nazi genocide, those that were killed as what is called wrongfully gypsies, but Roma descendants, they speak of their memory through, through music, many of them. They speak of their memory also during and also after through uh, uh, um, chant through music through their through the way they perceive reality which is a different kind of expression and they actually one of those testimonies of Roma Tessa says I don't understand how you can you know tell your story in words I would never be able to do that I can only tell it in music and to us maybe it doesn't make sense but to me it makes perfect sense because again tra trauma is something that's by definition almost unable to express and as soon as you formulate it to expression there's something that you're deflating about it. You know, and also the students can be sure that the disappointment of words, do you know that feeling? The words disappoint. I chose them, but they still disappoint me because they don't carry the meaning. Imagine that with the traumas they went through and how disappointing words would be. This is not something I'm saying. This is something that Primo Levi and Zalman Grodowski and many, many survivors say of how they're disappointed with the words they're using. So that's why expand art, music, oral. Tell them that the different standpoints of seeing the story doesn't 
I think helps them to, yes, to better understand the what had happened and who these people were. Okay. I'd like to just add to what David said, that we have the entire collection of USC Shoah here at Stockton available online. Those of you that are part of our faculty know that. Our dual high school credit teachers, all of your students have access to that. And all our VIP attendees today, if you want to have access during the school year to testimonies, we can arrange that through for you through our library website. So get in touch with us and anyone that is as just to let you know, a Stockton student or affiliated with Stockton always has access to it. And we have one step more uh, to share with you. I'm sure that as some of you watched 60 Minutes, it was highlighted on CBS 60 Minutes. We are a test site, the only one in the world. So I'm showing off for USC Shoah, uh, where we have an interactive biography here on campus of Ed Mosper, who is a Holocaust survivor. And I want to say, Dr. Deutsch, we've never fully questioned him about faith. So we're going to do that this afternoon, uh, you know, after we finish this workshop. Uh, we have funding available for your students to come here to the university to meet a virtual Holocaust survivor where they can ask questions. And I want to say, that one of the, the items that we've learned, which we never thought about before, is students have the ability to ask questions that they're uncomfortable asking a human. Although once they get done, they say, you know, I felt like he was there, but they can ask those touchy questions that we've been asking you um, today. So, uh, and the last part is that we have a faculty member here, Dr. Carol Rittner. Uh, Carol is a nun, a sister of mercy, and she worked for Ellie Wiesel. And so she has developed teaching materials on some of these issues. Uh, we are part of Facing History in Ourselves. We have their resource book. We have about 10 items that we can send to you in a package. So just email us afterwards and we have made teaching materials, what we call in the States across the curriculum using night. So thank you so much for that question because then I could, and Cheryl just answered. Cheryl, do you wanna share with us just for a minute or two what you wrote just so we can, um, you can illuminate on that? Sure, Gail, thanks. I just wanted everybody to know that Echoes and Reflections in our unit on the final solution, we do have an excerpt from Night. Um, we do have art, as David spoke about, uh, that is so important when you are using different primary sources. And we will be having a webinar in August with a musicologist named Tamar Machado, who speaks about art in the, rather music in the Holocaust. And as soon as I stop speaking, I'll get into our website and I'll send a link in the chat box. Thank you. Sure. All right, so we have several questions from our students in Pleasantville, but I first wanted to go to one of our uh, professors here at Stockton, uh, Dr. Judith Vogel. Go ahead, Dr. Vogel, you should be able to unmute now. Hi, Dr. Deutsch, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, it, I, I find that the concept of faith to be a really important one when talking to college students, because I find it's a time in their life when they're really thinking about questions of faith as well. Um, and so I do broach this topic, not nearly as in depth as, as this presentation. I'm really grateful for the resources you've given. But the one thing I do try to convey is sort of the difference between um, the cultural side of faith and, and sort of the personal side of faith. So some of the rituals that you were talking about that may just be part of tradition uh, sort of versus that internal um, independent faith a person might have. And so there's um, a quote and I, I don't have the name on, on uh, available, but I, I remember reading a survivor who said something like, um, 
I'm no longer Jewish. She had lost her faith. Um, and she said, I'm no longer Jewish. And so Hitler won with me. Like he, he took that one thing which he despised and he took it from me. And her response to that was to keep at least the rituals alive and the traditions alive. And I think you sort of touched on that a little bit with that one um, interview that you also displayed. And, and I was curious if you, you've seen more of that uh, sort of in your research where the ritual was still very much impor important, even though maybe the personal side of faith had fallen away. Yes, absolutely yes. There are a number of testimonies that, that discuss the importance of ritual despite the fact that the faith is fading away, but it also has to do with something that uh, has to do with Jewish tradition in general. When, when, when you look at, at compare both Jewish and Islamic traditions as negated to Christian traditions, the Jews have halakha, and in Islam there's the sharia. And in both, the importance of practice is just as and sometimes even more than faith. There's even a debate in the Talmud where a person just does the ritual without even believing in God, is that considered a good ritual? And to some, I, you know, some people say it is. So in that historical traditional balance of what it means to be a devout Jew, there's usually a very strong element of what you do rather than what you believe in to many of those people. So it also has to do with the cultural heritage of the balance between faith and practice in Jewish tradition. And that's why I, I do find other testimonies that have that kind of balance where they say, I'll do the practice, but you can't force me to believe, something like that. So it, it's not uncommon, but it doesn't, many, I'd say still most of them question and restructure everything they know. Even if it's considered in the same sort of frame, it's still very different in content and perception. All right, so I think, uh, Darren, some of your students had questions. Uh, do you wanna unmute and we can- I'm really looking forward to those questions. There were some excellent questions from several students. Go ahead. And I wanted to ask, what happened to the Jews that were caught practicing their religion in the camps? Okay, excellent question. And you know, I'll answer it in, in, in through a um, diary that I, I edited, the diary of Zalman Gradovsky. He said, do you know what was the worst thing about the Nazi response in the camps? The randomness of it. At times, the response could have been nothing. They could have looked away and say, do what you do. Usually not, but it could have been. And at times it could have just killed them on spot. And at times it could have humiliated them. Now, that's one answer. It differs, it usually would be very violent, not always killed, but very violent, but not always. And the second, you said Nazi response. There are other groups within the camps. Sometimes the Jewish group suffered violence from other groups in the camps when they practiced their traditions, not only from the Nazis. In some testimonies, other prisoners would be the ones harassing them for their, and that's why most of these prayers or these activities were in the bath, in the, the, the loo, the bathroom, you know, in the, and, and weren't out. Many of them tried to hide it as much as they could, had a guard outside to make sure no one sees. Usually they wouldn't be shot on spot for it. They would be beaten uh, because Nazis didn't want to lose a worker for it. Because you have to understand those in concentration camps were Nazi workers, were a commodity, were seen as slaves for their work until they're done with them. So they wouldn't want to lose them over that ritual they're doing or not doing. But uh, as again, I would say it was random. It was usually violent. Usually they wouldn't kill them. And they also didn't only suffer from Nazi violence, but also from violence from other um, groups in the camps as well. Thank you for that question. Uh, my name is Nicholas, and the question that I wanted to know was, do you think that people lost belief 
once they were out of the camp and God because they think that it was God's fault that they were put in the camp. Did people believe, Nicholas, thank you. Did people believe in God because they think that God is the one that put them in the camp? That's a hard question to answer. I think um, Katsetnik, for example, one survivor said, yes. He said that over the chimneys of Auschwitz, he didn't see Satan, he saw God, which is a horrific and incredible thing to say. He said, no, it wasn't, it was, he said he was the one putting, I didn't understand why, but he was the one putting me there. And I think one of the testimonies that, that, that you know, really opened my mind to how they see it was a testimony of a, 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 a professor named Tzvi Bachrach. He said, yeah, I believe God did it to us. And when they asked him, okay, you know, how, why did he do it? He says, you know, I don't have an answer for it, but there are other things as well. There's good in the world, there's our children, there's like a paradox which he's unable to solve. So to answer your question in full, many of them did see, those who did believe saw God as the entity putting them there, but at the same time didn't have an apologetic answer for why. Oh, uh, Darren, you, you got muted again. Okay, there you go. Hello, my name is Adelie, and I have a question regarding um, the Jews who doubted um, their beliefs after being released, did they um, start having faith again? Did, you're asking if Jews after they were released started having faith again about those, that group? Yes. Surprisingly, let's, let's, let's begin with a bit of statistics. Surprisingly, we are homo sapiens and homo sapiens like sticking to their beliefs even though reality says other things. I'm not gonna mention global warming, but that's an example of that. What I'm trying to say is that 90% of the people that believed in a certain thing before the war, about 90% believe in the same thing after. If they don't believe in God before, they usually don't believe in God after. If they do, they usually will believe after. Um, that's in 90, it would be a different God. It would be a different perception. It would be in a different understanding, but they usually stick to that. I don't know if it's 90 or 85, but most of them stick to the same thing. Those percentages that shift sides, many of them do that from what I know and the research I've done is for social reasons. Let me give you an example. My grandfather was not so religious before the war and not during the Holocaust. And the only reason, and he admits that to me, the only reason he began religion, he tells me, and, and I'll use that, is because your Bobby told me. It means it's because your grandmother told me to be. That's the only reason. And he was religious all of his life from the moment he got married until the moment he died at the age of 92. And every time he says the reason he was religious after the war was because he wanted to get married that was her condition. He says, that condition is worth it for me. I've had, <laughs> I've heard of worse conditions. So I'm saying that because I think that for those who shifted sides, there was a strong social element in most cases. Any other questions? Dear students, I love your questions. Gosh. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Joshua. Uh, the question I, I have is, um, do you believe any of the disc discriminatory efforts made towards the Jews in Nazi Germany had an effect on them uh, losing their faith in uh, their religion? Um, did it have an effect on, on Jews losing their, their religion or on Nazis losing their religion? Jews. Some of them were Jews. religious as well. Jews. On the Jews, you mean? Oh, yeah, the Jews, the Jews. Yes, the Jews. Yes, absolutely, yes, yes. It had an effect, yes. Many of them... I, I wouldn't say losing, because use the word losing. I'd say restructuring, which means they're confronted with conditions where what they believe in cannot fit the reality they're undergoing. D you know, when, when I hear the testimonies of the, the women I showed you today, and they ask me, do you think they believe more or less? In my perception, they believe way more because their belief is so comprehensive, they could 
in hold in their belief doubt and not knowing their belief is broader. So, so in a way, when you say lose, I, I, I'd say in some cases, absolutely, yes. But in some cases, it's more to restructure and to adapt and in a way even to expand their perception of what God is and what the relationship between their personalities, their belief, their need for belief, and what they actually believe in are in tandem as, 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 a, a, as a whole. So did they affect them to lose their religion? To some degree, yes, much less than what is perceived. Thank you, Darren and, and students from Pleasantville. Fantastic questions. Um, so I think we probably have time for one more question um, for you, Dr. George. And one of them is, Gail, you were going to answer about where we could answer, or where we could find some of the uh, testimony clips that you presented today, uh, Dr. Deutsch. I know there are a lot for were from the USC Shoah Foundation. Yeah, they're all from the USC Shoah Foundation. And also, I just want to say one thing that for me, I didn't begin this as a research and I want the students actually to listen to this. I began this because I, I was interested in what these things mean for myself. This is not what I wrote my PhD on even. And, 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 and I went into the USC found, Shaw Foundation thing and I looked for search words of prayer. I wanted to see what these survivors mean when they say prayer, there's search words there. And it's very simple to use. All you, you go on the website, you put in a search word, and you find endless amount of testimonies about that specific topic, whether it's uh, uh, belief, prayer, it could be morality, it could be friendship, it could be psychology, it could be psychiatry. There's so many interesting things there. So you just put in a keyword and start, you know, reaching from place to place and and like like this 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 uh, domino effect of knowledge, so that's that's to to relate uh, to what you said. We made the investment at Stockton University when very few places had the testimonies. You did at that time, Yad Vashem. Very few universities in the United States did. I think there were four at the time, because you can teach a whole unit, the whole unit of Holocaust studies just using the USC Shoah testimonies. They are rich, they're terrific. Um, I give homework assignments with my students. I'm not gonna take up your time now with that. But again, you as our VIP educators will make a way that if you don't have what we call a Z number for the university and all our dual high school credit students do, all our dual high school credit teachers do, and all our uh, faculty and graduate and undergraduate students do, we'll try to make that work for you. It is amazing. You put in a keyword, like even something, if you're doing the diary of Anne Frank, you put in Anne Frank, and all of a sudden we have Meep Geese come up, who uh, was very integral in her being saved. So I think um, we definitely have time for one more question, Morgan. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so the last question then will come from Victoria Kessler. Victoria, uh, I'm unmuting you now. Thank you so much, Dr. Joich, um, for this complex discussion. I am lucky enough to teach a full year high school class on Holocaust and genocide studies. And so I always try to approach these opportunities as what can I personally get out of it? But then where are my students going to challenge me with these particular themes? And one of the questions that I could see myself being challenged with, I would like to pose to you. Um, do you believe that the people whose testimonies we viewed today and others, do you think that these individuals were cognizant of these struggles of faith while they were going through the days of the Holocaust? Or do you think that really their understanding of the depth of their struggles came um, during their adult years through reflection as they unpacked everything that they have been through? Ex excellent question. And actually we have ways to answer it, like concrete ways to answer it. It's true that the oral testimonies are after, but we have memoirs from that time. And 
I, I won't generalize because I've only read several memoirs from the time, about like, about five or six memoirs of devout religious Jews. One of them is of Hadassah Levine. And to answer your question, absolutely yes. I mean, to some degree, while it is happening, she understands exactly which faith she's restructuring in order to fit her conditions mm. and how she restructures her prayers. And part of my presentation that I'll share with you is her different, at some point she doesn't pray to be saved. She prays to die quickly, for example. And she says, and she's aware of the change that happens. Some, in some other place in her diary, she says, you know, once I understood holiness in a certain way, but these conditions change the way I see holiness and holiness is simplicity. That's her perception changes. She's aware of that change. She documents in her memoir. And by the way, she dies in 1946 after mm. she, you know, right after she finishes her diary, she doesn't really edit it even. The, the rights are given to her son and only in the 70s it's published. And it's written in Hebrew. And by the way, there is up until today, no English translation of that diary. And there are reasons for it. You know, the misrepresentation of, of the, the religious story, etc. But I'm saying this because this is one example of a 100% reflective woman when it is happening, aware of her processes, when it, she, she, and writing it as, it as it happens, and rewriting it after the war if she misses out a few things. So there are two versions of it. So this is just but one example, but I think generally, not always, yes. There's, I didn't find such a great difference as far as their reflectivity while or after. And that's surprising to me, but that's what I found. Thank you so much, Dr. Deutsch. We have never addressed this subject. And I can't quickly go back into my chat, but I love what Judy, Dr. Judy Vogel said. So thought provoking, challenging to us, changing some of the ways that we're going to be teaching moving forward. And you have an open invitation. Come on down. We'd love to have you visit our campus in person. And we hope that we'll get to know you even more. So thank you so much.